And if you look at China, they have 11 shipyards running 24-7, 365. We have two. They have, they, it, just 10 years ago, they had 35 ships. Now they have 350 ships. They have more ships in their Navy than we do now. Uh, they are preparing for war. And just like in World War II, the U.S. and our investors are the ones who help build their war machine by investing money in China. Kyle Bass, founder and CIO of Heyman Capital Management and founder of the private equity firm Conservation Equity Management, and also a proud American and a proud Texan. It is so great to welcome you back on the show. Great to see you, Kyle. Glad to be here, Julia. Well, I'm glad to have you back on. And you were one of my favorite people to talk to, and you were a big hit the last time. So I was kind of hoping we could start uh, where I like to always start, which is the big picture, uh, more of that macro view for you. Um, it's been several months since we had you on. So what is the updated uh, macro picture for you today? What are you most focused on? You know, I had a in between our our last experience and this one, I had a um, kind of out of body experience being in the room with four uh, former Fed governors and the head of, let's just say, a bunch of the the current heads of many of the uh, central banks around the world, and it was kind of a Chatham House rule. So I won't go into who said what, but going to the content, I had this like uh, experience that. We, I sat and listened, and, and also professors at the at the top finance business schools in the world were also there. There's about 20 of us there. And um, they were talking about the Phillips curve. Uh, and they were talking about, as you know, that, that kind of uh, uh, relationship between unemployment um, and, and wages and how, how the economy works. And... They were they were they got into this long winded, very academic discussion about what's driving the service sector's desire for additional wages. They were saying they were wondering if it was the expectations of future inflation driving the service sector's desire for higher wages. And I said, have any of you guys spoken with like a waiter or a waitress about this in the last you know few months, year? Now, they all looked at each other like, have you, have you, have you? And of course, they hadn't. And I said, you know, you guys printed 40% more M2, and you put it into the market in 18 months. You've never done that before in the history of the Fed. And what happened? You generated about 40% inflation. And now, because inflation is chain-weighted, we don't see those numbers, right? We see, you and I both know, Julia, that if you are buying a house or renting, if you're driving a car, if you're eating, if you're going out to eat, if you have to stay in a hotel room at any point in time, you know damn well that rents moved 18% in 2021. They moved another 19% in 2022. Rent basically moved 40% in two years because there was that much more money in the system. And um, wages haven't come anywhere near moving 40% in two years, right? So, mm -hmm. you know, we even this morning, you had people talking about, oh, sticky inflation and wages and wage inflation. And I said to these guys, I was like, all the service sector is trying to do when you talk to them is break even. They're taking a second and a third job because all they have to pay is rent, their car payment, their insurance, and their food. And the price of all of those things went up a lot more than their wages did. So their wages are just trying to catch up. This has nothing to do with a waiter or waitress uh, getting into inflation expectations. This is them just trying to pay their bills. So it's a long-winded way of saying, I still think the Fed is completely out of touch with reality. And I think that the price level has gone from, let's say if you indexed it at par or 100 back pre-COVID, and, and now I think that price level has moved from par to 140. I think wages have moved, I don't know, maybe, maybe 8%, maybe a little more. Wages have a long way to go. Uh, and I don't expect the price level uh, to suffer serious declines. I expect, you know, if if the Fed wanted to generate deflation for a minute, this is why they always say it's transitory. They, are, they If you go from 100 to 140, and then you get a print at 138, you can say, oh, we've solved the problem. And no more inflation, it's deflation. When in, when in reality, the price levels move still 38%. And then if they are able to get back to their trend level inflation of 2%, we're back at 140 a year later, we're at 142 the next year. This is the kind of the fallacy of the Fed. So when I think about macro, I think that the price level is abnormally high. 
Uh, it's abnormally high because of the amount of stimulus they put in the market um, going into COVID. And I think the reason you're seeing stocks in Japan and other places move is stocks went down. If you remember 2022, they went down 23%. I think the S&P was down 23 Imagine if you lost 40% of your purchasing power through price and then you lost another 23% your stock portfolio, you got massacred, right? Yeah. So stocks generally keep up uh, with about 80, 80, 85% of the inflation. So you can't, uh, I don't know, I, I think you're going to see um, more wage inflation, which means we're going to get to a point uh, where we've already seen significant stagflation. And now we're going to see uh, real wages start to move a bit. And I don't think the price level is going to come down very much. Yeah. On the point about, and that's such a like telling anecdote, just the simple question of like, have you talked to a waiter or a waitress in this environment? On that point though, about the Fed being out of touch, does, did that, I want to, I don't, I, mean, I know you don't want to break Chatham House rules, but what were they shocked when you asked the question? Were they confused or were you surprised by their answer? Like it, just, just this notion of them being out of touch with like everyday Americans. Yeah. Well, it was just for me, it was one of those out of body experiences because for 45 minutes between top finance professors and ex-Fed governors, we talked about the Phillips curve when this has nothing to do with the Phillips curve. This is the price level move 40% and people are just trying to catch up. It's that simple. Like, yeah. I just think. They're they're still engaging in, in their their elite academics, and they believe that their problem set is the only problem set, and the variables that are input to that problem set are the only variables that are allowed in. And it's so obvious to the market practitioners exactly what happened. Yeah, and then on the point about price levels, um, do you think I want to hear more on your thesis on the inflation bit? Do you think well, there's still ways to go here? Um, maybe is the CPI, is it not reflective of the, like the real story? What is kind of your thought process there? Well, Julie, when you talk about chain weighting, it's really important. So a great example is in, in autos. Um, 30 years ago, the average price of a car was $14,000. Today, the average price of a car is like $48,000, right? It's, uh, it's, it's basically triple. Uh, right. So what percentage of that 300 percent increase in car price do you think has actually been factored into the reported CPI? Five percent. So your wallet knows that it's moved 300 percent. And in reality, when you write your check for a car, you have to write the check for the for the current car and not the chain weighted car. And what that means is they take today's car and they say, but Julia, 30 years ago, the basic car only had uh, roll-up windows. Uh, they weren't electric. So if you subtract the price of the electric window today and install a roll-up window, and today you have this digital, big digital dashboard. Well, if you subtract the price of the digital dashboard and want to put an analog a dashboard back in, you'd save a lot of money. So they chain weight today's car back then, and they say, well, prices have really only moved 5%. It's complete bullshit, right? And they do that with everything. They chain weight everything. So if you're, you, you can't, your wallet doesn't know chain weighting. Your wallet gets drained because you're paying the actual price and not the hoped price of chain weighting to compare back to 30 years ago. So what the Fed's done is, is intentionally basically rig the calculation to always show us a lower number than, than reality. And the reason being many of the things that that are payments the government makes are, are cost of living adjusted as per the CPI. So they don't want to show you what the real CPI is. But I, I'd imagine if you went back three years and looked at your bills mm -hmm. uh, for, ver for very specific things that you do for food, for energy, for your heating, cooling bill, your car payment, I guarantee you, you would see much higher than the CPI. Yeah, no, and I, I, I'm kind of a creature of habit too. And like, I usually buy the same things at the grocery store. And so I remember even when prices were going up, com complaining about it or mentioning it to Alec all the time. Cause I'm like, I would see, I would see exactly what you're talking about, especially at the grocery store. Um, and, and think about what's happening today. You had the, the UPS workers, uh, you know, UPS union walked out on UPS because the, you know, they're demanding higher wages and rightly so they can't afford to live. So the service sector is getting massacred. And 
You know, you, ha- you saw Kamala Harris over the weekend tweet, oh, Bidenomics is doing amazing. The IRA is great. What, the, what these elites don't understand is it, that, that inflation disproportionately affects the poor and the middle class. And, uh, and I think that's why you're seeing the frictions in society uh, continue to move higher. Yeah, I want to hear more on that part, the frictions in society. Can you elaborate a bit more? Well, I mean, look, look around the world. What do we just see? And I, and I realize some of these things are atrocities, but when the French police shot uh, a Muslim uh, boy that was, um, one could say, resisting arrest and, and things like that. I don't know if you saw the video, but all of France erupts and they, they burn half the country down. Um, when you think about, when you think back to societal frictions, really uh, starting to, to to kind of move out of control, you had the Arab Spring. That man lit himself on fire because of food availability and food prices. You think back to Tiananmen Square, 1989. One of the basic gripes of the Chinese uh, students was food prices and food availability. So w- when you have significant periods of inflation, you have increased societal friction. So when you look at crime, you look at depression, you look at all of these things that are going on in the United States, the numbers are going much higher. Now, COVID has something to do with that because they locked us up for a very long period of time. We created huge mental health problems. We created huge health problems um, in, in, in the world's economies. But on top of that, we printed a huge amount of money uh, and inflation is disproportionately affecting those. So I'm sure you see everywhere in the United States, crimes higher. Uh, it's either marginally higher or a lot higher uh, in the last three years. And I think that's largely due to inflation widening the gap between the haves and have nots. And again, disproportionately affecting the poor uh, and truthfully Kamala Harris's kind of voters. Yeah, that's a good point. Like I lived in New York for 12 years and I was just there recently. I would, I haven't been on the subway since before I, before lockdowns and I couldn't, I wouldn't get on. I'm too scared at this point. Um, you know, subway subway uh, violence is up 44, 44% in three years, according to New York's crime stats. I mean, that's a big number. Yeah, that's a huge number. Let me ask you um, on the economic picture. Are you in the- I said three months. Sorry, I meant three years. Sorry. No, understood. And thanks for the correction. Three years. On the economic front, are you in the camp that we are headed for a recession? What are your views there? Oh, yeah. I mean, you look at bank lending, bank lending is off. But for all intents and purposes, only the best credits for the best deals, a very small subset of the market. Um, yeah, bank lending, uh, bank credit has been turned off. Uh, the Fed is going to crowd out bank deposits. I think if you look at the fiscal deficit that's been announced, what what has to what has to be achieved going in between now and year end, we're in uh, July, you're going to have another $900 billion um of of treasuries issued and that money is going to come out of uh um you know bank deposits so i i think you're going to see bank deposits continue to decline i think you're going to see bank lending halted the fed's going to crowd out uh, uh the fed and the treasury are going to crowd out uh uh the markets and you're you're absolutely going to have a recession i just don't know um how long it will be um do you have any sort of thesis on like the magnitude of it um like bigger I mean, than what we saw in it's, 2008. It's so it's so hard to the reason it's hard to predict this time yeah. is the amount of excess cash in the system is so high. Yeah. The rich people have all the money. Uh, I know market prognosticators say there's still a trillion dollars worth of of spending that's coming from the private sector because they have a trillion dollars of excess savings. It's all in the hands of the rich. Yeah. So yeah, branded luxury products continue to trade up in price, but. You're not going to see broad-based spending, and you've already seen a number of economies really start to cool down uh, across Europe, across uh, Asia, and potentially now across the United States. It's just going to—it just takes time for this mechanism to work. Yeah, um, I guess on, on some other quick topics related to the economy, um, I was just thinking about um, commercial real estate, and maybe for context for folks, you um, made your name shorting subprime. Um, during the last financial crisis. I know you've made comments lately on commercial real estate. I couldn't track them down in full, but what are your thoughts there? Look, it was this was so funny. I sat with Bloomberg's editorial board and we talked for two hours on 
on China, on on very specific, uh, let's say, aspects of of the U.S. markets, world markets, and then at the very end, you know, uh, almost like a non sequitur comment, one of the one of the journalists in the room said, you know, what what do you think about commercial real estate and office buildings in particular? Um, and you know, we think that the commercial, the, we think the U.S. banking system is going to lose two hundred. We think about two hundred twenty-five billion dollars in office alone. Now, the U.S. banking system has about two trillion of equity. So, if they lose ten percent of their equity, is it a big hit? Yes. Is it a crisis? No. Uh, but that's if everything was evenly distributed. And you know, some banks are heavier uh, on the asset side in in commercial real estate, and some of those are heavier in office. Um, so there'll be a few more bank failures. It's not the end of the world. It's not systemic. It's not going to be a giant problem. Uh, but of course, that was like the main headline that came out of that two hour meeting was like a two minute conversation. However, uh, what I said was office buildings in blighted downtown areas, uh, if they're B and C office buildings, A buildings will do OK uh, as some people come back to work. B and C, I, I kind of said something hyperbolic. And I said, you know, you're just going to have to bulldoze those things. Um, you know, there was one of one of my friends runs one of the biggest, con, you know, commercial equity or commercial real estate groups uh, in the U.S. And he said that they they were marketing a building in California that Bank of America built less than 10 years ago. It's four story standalone Bank of America building. They couldn't sell it to anyone. So they finally sold it and they sold it to an industrial user who literally bulldozed a decent building and built an industrial space there. Um, so, you know, I had just heard that anecdote the day before and uh, I threw it out there because it was true. Uh, and, you know, I, I got so much hate mail for that. It was crazy. Oh my God. Like one comment from a two hour session. Wow. Um, yeah. I would have loved to watch the full two hours. I, I couldn't find I, it anywhere online, but no. It was a it was a private meeting, but oh you know, okay, got it. The various okay. ju- the various journalists took took pieces of it and, and wrote wrote about it. Understood. Um, and yeah, I could see that happens at times. Mm. Um, okay, let's turn to China. Um, we have Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen, um, visiting this week. I I'm, I'm sure you have a lot to say on it. I want to hear. Um, may, w- let's address that and then what what how you're thinking about China today. You know, it's just it has just continued to worsen over time. Um, when you've got our, you have the U.S. Secretary uh, uh, of State begging for meetings with the Chinese after they flew the Chinese spy balloon over here and said, if if we ever release the data on exactly what they were measuring and what the capabilities of the balloon were, they would never meet with us again. So we suck it up. We agreed to, to hold it internally uh, and then beg for meetings over there. I think it's. We, 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 I call it the, uh, uh, the appeasement caucus. Someone has really energized the appeasement caucus. We are the strongest country in the world. We have a set of morals and values that supposedly we live by. Secretary Blinken himself said when he was campaigning that we will never trade human rights for an economic deal. And yet there he is swallowing his pride on, on his knees, begging the Chinese interlocutors for meetings. And when he arrives, no one greets him at the airport, except for some underlings. Uh, and they take him to the airport in a, in a show of kind of defiance by the Chinese. It was like when President Obama arrived there and they made him get off the back of the airplane onto the, if you remember that, the back stairwell. It They constantly, constantly view what we're doing as weak. And so you have Janet Yellen uh, begging for meetings and going to China. When Secretary of Defense Lloyd Austin has begged the Chinese military to put in a phone line between our military and theirs to avoid any kind of uh, misunderstandings, assuming they, you know, they, we have ships collide in the in the South China Sea, or we have their airplanes have been and been running what we call unprofessional maneuvers right off the the, the noses of our airplanes in international airspace. Um, so the Chinese are becoming more militaristically belligerent, more economically belligerent, more legally belligerent. And yet here's Janet Yellen going over to China where they've just raided three U.S. companies for supposed national security concerns. They're the U.S. consultants doing due diligence on Chinese companies. Um, Their leader is 
committing ethnic and cultural genocide in Xinjiang. And Xi Jinping and Vladimir Putin jointly released their limitless partnership. And since then, she has ratified it. So she is now has a limitless partnership with a war criminal. And here's our Secretary of the Treasury going over to the meet with them and beg them to engage with us economically. It actually makes no sense. It's like I get up taking crazy pills every day. Uh, and the answer is Wall Street greed is the only thing that is keeping us moving forward. Yeah, I was going to ask you, like, why do you think that is? And you think it's, it's simple. It's, you know, when when the Jewish community said never again after the Holocaust, they should have put an asterisk by it and said never again unless we can make money uh, on the country that uh, uh, that is engaging in the genocide. It is it contravenes your basic moral thought. If if China wasn't such an economic powerhouse, we would never trade with them, given their activities around the world, given their lack of any belief in basic human rights. The, you think about our value systems, they're diametrically opposed to one another. And yet we continue to engage. The only answer is greed. I um, read a piece that you and Jeffrey Sonnenfeld from Yale School of Management put out, um, and I'll get you to elaborate too, but it seems like maybe more of the business community is waking up to this since our last conversation, which was, I guess, last summer, last fall. Mm -hmm. Do you think more, though, is more kind of waking up to this? Like, what are you? I just want to hear like your thoughts there. Some, yeah, some, I mean, some of the as you know, look, as she becomes more belligerent, again, across the board, whether it's his speeches he gave at the 20th Party Congress or the two sessions where he told all of the PLA and the constituencies in the Chinese Communist Party to prepare for war over Taiwan. Uh, he gave very specific speeches about that. And then since then, or even, even prior to our last conversation, if you look at the changes in the Chinese legal system, in January of 2020, China updated their foreign investment law, which be gave Beijing the power uh, to nationalize foreign assets under special circumstances, which include war, their words, not mine. In June of 21, they instituted the uh, counter foreign sanctions law, which basically gave Beijing the power to nationalize foreign company assets and detain expat employees simply if the company was complying with foreign sanctions, i.e. if the U.S. put sanctions on China and it, there was a U.S. or European company that was complying with U.S. sanctions in China, they were to be arrested and their assets were to be seized. And just recently, just literally last week, uh, China passed a sweeping foreign policy rule that broadened the foreign sanctions rule that basically said... Um, it created obligations and responsibilities for Chinese companies to adhere to the national security law. And it also basically made broad, sweeping, very vague uh, uh, legalese about how anything that might be construed as a violation of Chinese national security, i.e. it becomes a political prosecution, not a legal prosecution. That was just enacted July 1st, uh, four days ago. So if you're a company doing business there and you actually have employees that are U.S. citizens, you're, you're, you, you, are, you are breaching your duty to your employees by actually having them on main, in mainland China or Hong Kong right now, given the way that China has changed their legal system. It's really, really crazy what's going on over there. Yeah. I had um, Nick Glinsman on the show recently of... Um... Malmgren Glinsman Partners. I'm, I'm sure you, you're familiar with Nick. I know you tweeted about him. And he yeah, yeah. was telling me, and I'd have to go, I don't, I'm kind of paraphrasing um, of folks that he was talking to, like people aren't sending like their their fund managers or their, like they're not sending their folks over there because they're fearful that they might not be able to leave. That's right. So one of the, one of the uh, authorities that this new law, uh, this, this sweeping foreign policy law gave Beijing it gave them the legal authority uh, to seize corporate and individuals assets and deny them exit visas. So you're you're then stuck in China forever. I mean, these are crazy things happening. Crazy. Yeah. Um, I guess like my follow on question, too, is. And I don't know if you have the answer to this, but do you do you kind of know, like ballpark, what the exposure is for, I guess, maybe U.S. businesses or even individual investors, they might not even be aware of their exposure 
to China and what that risk could be? Yeah. So as you know, they're active, there's active investment, passive investment. Passive is larger uh, because China corrupted um, Henry Hernandez at, at, uh, at, at MSCI. So if you look at the MSCI indices and you look at the Bloomberg Lehman uh, Global Bond Aggregate Index, we think about a trillion two of passive money has been invested uh, in China. Uh, again, because you're simply indexing against MSCI EM, MSCI World, and the Bloomberg Bond Index. Um, on the active side, it's another several hundred billion dollars. And then in, in, in foreign direct investment and in FDI in its totality, we think it's, uh, well, they reported just over $3 trillion. Um, And so that includes corporate PP&E over there, right? Like Tesla's Gigafactory factory and uh, all of the, call it, physical plant assets over there. So investors, we think the numbers, you know, somewhere around a trillion five, and we think the balance is, is FDI. Yeah. How about on the, um, the last time you and I also spoke, um, the risk of China invading Taiwan? Yeah. Do you think that that we've seen, has that probability in your mind, has that increased since we last spoke? It has. Um, I believe it's inevitable. If you just listen to Xi Jinping's own world, own words, and you look at what they're doing, again, in their mainland legal, uh, in their mainland legal system, if you look at the mainland uh, preparation for war, they're building 18 new air raid shelters in Fujian province, which is right uh, opposite the Taiwan Strait from Taiwan. They're building the largest combat hospital in China's history. They're, they are encouraging, incentivizing, and forcing their population to go give blood uh, to build up their blood bank. I mean, these are text, textbook war preparation uh, maneuvers. Uh, if you look at what they're doing in the financial markets, Julia, um, they still run uh, a $380 billion trade deficit with America, uh, or surplus. They run a $380 billion surplus. We run a $380 billion deficit in trade alone with China. But if you look at their current account, which takes into account investment flows and kind of it's the net income of a sovereign, their current account is still positive by about $425 billion. Uh, if you were a sovereign and you had a positive current account of $400 billion, what would you do with your dollars, especially if the U.S. has, number one, we have the deepest, most liquid capital markets in the world. Number two, we have the highest interest rates in the world. You would be buying U.S. treasuries with that money. They have been wholesale selling treasuries. They had, they, their biggest position was about a trillion two in treasuries. That's down to about $850 billion now. Uh, and they've been selling treasuries. Uh, just in the last few months, they bought a, a little bit. Uh, but they're they're down 850 billion, which at the cadence they were selling in the past is down to months and not years if they wanted to get that down to a zero balance. And why that's so important, Julia, that's a non-economic movement. What they're doing doesn't make sense. What would make sense is they run big dollar surpluses, they buy dollar treasuries, and we have the highest yields and deepest capital markets in the world. So they're doing something that makes no economic sense with the money uh, because what they're trying to do, in my opinion, is insulate themselves from severe U.S. sanctions. They saw the U.S. and Europe grab Putin's FX reserves when he invaded Ukraine. He has $360 billion of FX reserves in the West. We don't know how much they were able to uh, uh, sequester or, or grab onto the authorities, but China, excuse me, is not going to leave that to chance. So when you look at all of the various indicators of what they're doing in their legal system, in the financial world, and in the military world on their on their joint exercises, they're they are absolutely in every bucket preparing for war. Mm. Okay. Another follow-on, because I like what you said about um, and this is I, this is what I think you do. You read what they put out. You read the primary documents, the text. You don't. It's not just right. what, what the headlines are in the media. Can we hear more on your process um, and the importance of going and reading what they're actually putting out into the world? Um, I just want to hear more on that bit. Yeah, it's. I think it's again really important uh, to talk about exactly what Xi Jinping says because 
one of the things that was lost on the press coming out of the 20th Party Congress was really interesting. Um, normally, when they give you the working papers before the conference, that's it. It is uh, the conference is done. Everything else is just a rubber stamp. It's uh, 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 and what happened at the end of the 20th Party Congress, you probably remember, it shocked the world when they removed Hu Jintao on the final day, physically removed him and humiliated him in front of uh, the Standing Committee and the Politburo. Uh, and when she did that, he also changed the working documents. And that was kind of lost on the press. And there was a reason why uh, he he took out the words reform and opening and he inserted the phrase great struggle. And he did that in seven different places. And why that's important is when the Chinese characters for great struggle were put into the Chinese document, they China itself translates to English and sends the English press the English version. They mistranslated it intentionally. They called it <laughs> they <laughs> they called it hard times. They called it uh uh I'm trying to remember exactly what they called it now. I don't have it in front of me. Uh a difficult time or something like that. Great struggle is really important in 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 the in the terms of of China's century of humiliation, in terms of what he's preparing his people to do, uh, and 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 when you when you look at his words, this is how he closed the twentieth Party Congress. I'm going to read you his words. Our country's development has entered a period of coexisting strategic opportunities, risks, and challenge challenges. In this period of increasing uncertain and unpredictable factors. All types of black swan and gray rhino events may occur at any time. We must strengthen our sense of worry, adhere to bottom line thinking of party security, and prepare for danger, and prepare to undergo high winds and waves, and even stormy seas of a major test. He literally tells you it's coming. And nowhere in the press was that carried. And I'm so looking at, I'm looking at the speech, too, and I wonder if I have the wrong copy of the speech. Well, again, what's interesting about that is that you have the you have what the Chinese government sent you as the translation. You don't have Chinese scholars translating the China version for you. Mm -hmm. So a lot is lost in translation uh, if you're if you're comparing and contrasting those two documents. Again, that's just one. Now. Matt Pottinger, the former uh, uh, deputy, uh, uh, you know, uh, head of, of the uh, uh, National Security Council for China and for Asia writ large, he's the one who first noticed that subtle difference. And Matt's a good friend, and we discussed it at length. Um, I didn't notice it. I don't read Mandarin. Uh, but again, having people that are friends in that arena and having people that are proper translators Will, will carry you a lot further in, in, instead of reading the New York Times, which, of course, might have uh, their own agenda uh, here as part of, you know, the, let's just say the former globalist crew. They're starting to get a little tougher on China, too. And I think I think Xinjiang and the, the genocide, you know, flipped a number of journalists into realizing that we weren't talking puppy dogs and rainbows with China any longer. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think too, like just an, it's an important lesson to go and read the documents. Like you said, also the stuff that gets lost in translation. And um, but I was trying to be inspired by you. Like when this came out, it was just like, let me go and sit down and read this. And I was marking it up and with my own thoughts at the time. But it, it's interesting to know. I'll, I'll have to look at which document you're actually seeing because you probably have the Chinese government translation of the Chinese document. And you're probably right. But yeah, there's the paragraph with the black, the mention mentioning of the black swan. I think was it gray rhino was the other thing. Um, but the black swans, I was looking at that paragraph, but I, I, I could totally see where I have the different translation. That's um, exactly right. Yeah. Okay. So let me bring this up with you because you're mentioning some of the, um, the points that made you made you come to this conclusion that they're preparing for war based on some of the actions, whether it's the the blood banks, the hospital, all these things. Do you think? Because I was reading, I read um, Brigadier General Spalding's book um, "War Without Rules," which is about the document "Unrestricted Warfare." That um, I, I guess they're Chinese colonels that wrote it in 1999. You know much better than I do. But yeah. um, he was explaining, uh, he explains the document, he explains that unrestricted warfare and does a breakdown and explains the different sections of it. Um, so do you think that we have a different perception of 
of like what war is and they and then I just want to hear your thoughts there because I'm sure you've read the document and I'm not you know, really good at I asking think, the question, but I, I I think it's look, this is very similar in time to the period that 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 just uh predated World War II. Nobody wants war. I don't want war. General Spalding doesn't want war. You know, uh, the, the, there, when someone refers to you as a warmonger because you say she is preparing for war, I'm just I'm just being an analyst of his own words. It's it's something. It's clearly something I don't want. I don't want to lose one American's lives. And that, you know that is that is the that is the um, you know, I think that should be given when we're having a conversation like this. Going into World War II, we had just had uh, World War One, you know, end in the, in the early 1920s, and here we are uh, in uh, 20 years later, uh, going into the early 1940s, and you know, here's here's another uh, World War. And Churchill all along was saying since the late 1920s, early 1930s, hey, is anybody paying attention to the amount of time and effort that Hitler's putting into rebuilding? The German war machine. Um, that's all he's doing. And if you look at China, they have 11 shipyards running 24-7, 365. We have two. They have they, it, just 10 years ago, they had 35 ships. Now they have 350 ships. They have more ships in their Navy than we do now. Uh, they are preparing for war. And just like in World War II, the US and our investors are the ones who helped build their war machine by investing money in China. Uh, we lent the money, the US and the UK lent the majority of the money to Germany for it, for it to rebuild its society post the Weimar uh, uh, hyperinflation in, in 1923 and post the, the war uh, loss. And look, historically, both sides deficit spend going into a war and to the victor go the spoils and to the loser goes defeat and default just about every time. That's what happened to Germany back then. Both sides now are deficit spending, but China's focused on building its forces. Now, it's still behind. It's still about a generation behind on the shipbuilding side. It, while they have more ships, uh, their hulls are very thin and they make them very quickly and kind of typical, call it shipbuilding with Chinese characteristics. They believe their population of people are just expendable. If they lose a ship, they'll just build another one and put more people on it. We take that much more seriously. We take the lives of our men and women in service very seriously. And um, our ships are better, faster, more agile. They have they have two aircraft carriers. One was a junked Ukrainian character carrier that they bought, that a Chinese businessman bought supposedly to make it a casino. And in reality, it was the PLA buying it from Ukraine and refitting it to make it an aircraft carrier again. Um, both of their aircraft carriers run on diesel fuel. We have 11 that run on nuclear fuel. We're still a bit ahead uh, on our on our tactics, our strategy, and our Navy. However, we should be ringing alarm bells about what they're spending money on and why and how they're focused on it and how we're not focused on it. I just hope that we're waking up. Yeah, no, and I and I agree with you, and I agree with everything you said. Like, hope that we're waking up and paying attention. And you look at the world from the lens of an analyst as well, and you look at these um, geopolitical, um, happenings and events. And, um, I guess if you, if you had to advise, um, I guess like the U S government, if you will, like what, what would you suggest or as an approach here? It's really, it's really simple. You know, peace through weakness has never worked with totalitarian, autocratic dictators, whatever you want to call them. It never works. We showed that when you had you had Neville Chamberlain and Lord Halifax meeting with Hitler constantly and meeting with Goring and meeting with his people. And all they wanted was peace. They were actually willing to give Mussolini's advances to him if he promised not to invade anywhere else. That was sheer stupidity back then. They could have stopped Hitler if they went at him early. We can stop Xi if we go at him early. But the problem here, Julia, that means we're going to have a conflict. You want a small conflict where you where you're assured victory in the beginning, or you want to beg for peace all along until the dictator himself is going to make the move that's inevitable. And that's unfortunately that's where we are now. Uh, we have we have the Chamberlain Halifax appeasement caucus moving in, and we're showing we're trying to show uh, peace through weakness. We're trying to achieve peace through weakness. What we've got to do is start adopting a strong posture. 
We have to do it. If you think about the weakness in our, and this is not a political statement, if if we had Democrats in place that were strong Democrats that were willing to say, if you do this, we will react this way. We are not going to beg for meetings with you. We are not going to be uh, take these foreign policy gaffes the way you've been throwing them at us. We are going to be a responsible actor. And if you don't want to be responsible, we're going to disengage with you. Um, you know, I think we need what Ronald Reagan taught us was peace through strength works. It's how we brought down the Soviet Union. It's how we brought down the wall. And now this this we've had too long of a period of time in which all we seem to be caring about. And, and I know these things are important, but when we care about what color your hair is and what gender you are, and things like that, the world mocks us. We, those are tiny minorities of our population. They should have their place in the sandbox to do whatever they want to do. It should not be a policy on the forefront of U.S. consulates uh, flagpoles, which we saw last week, last last month. Everyone projects they they believe we're projecting weakness around the world by uh, focusing on uh, let's just say things that, that are really non sequiturs when you think about global policy. Yeah. Um, we only have a couple minutes left and I just want to hear, um, I think the last time you and I talked, you had this notion and correct me if I'm wrong and we can edit out if I'm wrong, that, um, one of the things that we need to do is really have like an economic department of war or something like that. Maybe I'm totally wrong and I'm mis. No, you're right. You. Okay, you're absolutely right. I want to hear more on that and what that could look like and how you would see that, like the benefits of that. I just want to hear more well, on that. You think think about Xi Jinping, right? He's entering his third term. He's emperor for life. Uh, he's already been in ten years. He's got another five in front of him. Uh, the U.S. has a revolving door in our presidency, whether it's every four years or every eight years. We need to be able to form a grand strategy. We must adopt a grand strategy and have that act and transcend administrations. Unfortunately, when a new administration comes in, they fire all uh, of the diplomats and they start over and they give uh, 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 the diplomatic credentials to those that, that donated them the most money or raised them the most money. You know, we don't have a coherent a policy of, of grand strategy. Now, the good news is our military stays the same. We don't replace our military every time we have a, a new administration. So uh, when you think about our war departments, I say there, 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 are four, there are four wars we can be fighting with China, uh, and three of which we've been fighting uh, now for uh, since they ascended the WTO. But when you think about the different war departments the U.S. should have, one, the call it kinetic war military department, where we arguably have the have the best war department in the world. The second one is cyber war department, and we have the best war department in the world there. We've got those two covered. Uh, the third is economic war. We don't have an economic war department. We, we field economic salvos like fly balls. Sometimes they go to treasury. Sometimes they go to commerce. Sometimes they go to the trade rep. Sometimes everybody talks about it. No one knows who's going to catch the ball. We need to have an economic war department in the United States. That is vital to understanding how some of our most well-heeled adversaries will act. You've already seen them just today. Uh, you, had, you had China restricting the export uh, of gallium and germanium that are used to in the in the semiconductor uh, wafer manufacturing process. You know that is a move. That is an economic war move uh, on the on the chessboard. Uh, we really don't have anyone uh, running that department uh, today. There are a number of people that, again, collaborate, but we need a war department. The other one uh, that the Chinese have such a great war department in is the propaganda department. Mm -hmm. They spend billions per year. They populate, uh, asymmetrically populate Facebook, Twitter, all of our social media. Now, it's interesting because we can't populate theirs. We, we through our openness, give them the asymmetric advantage in our social media and our data department. Uh, I think that's insane. I think we should engage in a reciprocal agreement. Whatever you let us do, we'll let you do. Uh, but we still need a data slash information war department, and we need an economic war department. Those two, we don't have, and we desperately need them. Well, Kyle Bass, it is always a pleasure having you on. If you want to share any parting thoughts, let folks know where they can follow you. Um, I know you're present on Twitter. Um, please take a moment to do so. Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, 
I I do this as a passion, and uh, I'm passionate about our country. I'm passionate about our um, our security in the long run. We all have kids. We all want those kids to grow up in a better world. We sit at a hinge in history right now, and as soon as people realize who the enemy actually is, you have to define the enemy before you can define the battle space. You asked earlier, how do we wake up? We must define China as the enemy. Our director of national intelligence once a year writes that report to Congress, the assimilation of all 16 intelligence agencies. He calls them exactly what they are, the biggest threat to US national security every year for the last few years. And yet Wall Street uh, and the director of national intelligence obviously don't see eye to eye. We've got to wake up and call the enemy the enemy, and then we can start defining the battle space. And I think that is uh, that is tantamount to us, uh, let's just say, defending our morals, our values, and our country going forward. Kyle Bass, CIO of Heyman Capital Management, thank you so, for being so generous with your time and your ideas, and always great to see you. Thanks, Kyle. Pleasure to be with you, Julia. Thanks.